Well, let's get into our initial conversation, and we're going to be talking about, well, focusing on what the vice president told us yesterday. He said, cleaning the banking sector, paying excess capacity charges, external shocks, and uh, the Russia-Ukraine war are uh, what have brought us here in terms of our economy. He has mounted a spirited defense at uh, Ghana's return to the IMF and believes the economy will be much stronger after the nation comes out of the IMF program. But he also warns of hard times ahead. This morning, we get into an analysis of what exactly the president, uh, the vice president said at the Accra Business School. And we're going to be interacting with Professor Lord Mensah, economist at the UG Business School, and uh, aide to former president, Mahama Felix Kwachi Ofosu. Both of them join the conversation. Uh, Prof, a very good morning to you. Uh, Felix, a very good morning to you as well. Yeah, good morning. Uh, who, who am I hearing now? Um, well, I good do morning, and good morning to our viewers. Okay, so I guess both of you, both of you are here uh, with us. Grateful to have you. So, yeah, can, can, can you can, can you hear me, please? Yes, I, I can hear you. I, I believe that is Professor Lord Mensah asking okay. whether I can hear him. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'm the one. I can hear you loud and clear, Prof. Uh, thank you, Felix, as well, for joining me uh, for the second time yeah. in what, what, two yeah. weeks? Yeah, thank you. But uh, if I may, let me indicate from the outset that, unfortunately for me, I have a commitment at 8 a.m., so my time is extremely limited. Okay. So I may not be able to go the full hall with you, but I, I hope to be able to. All right, so, so we're going to do a bit of bargaining. Uh, uh, yeah. Felix, let's do yeah. a bit of bargaining like we did with the, uh, the cola. From 20%, okay. some proposed 10%. We ended up at 15%. So yeah. uh, maybe do 8, 5, 8, 10 with us. Will that be That's possible? That's right. Okay, well, that all right. Eight, eight, five, eight, five, five. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Thank you very much. I'm noting that down now so we can stick to that. So, uh, Prof, if at some point you see me giving uh, Felix a bit more time for now, it would be because of what he said so that later I can also focus on you. But I'll be, I'll be sharing the time between the two of you. Is that okay with you, Prof? Professor Benza? Yeah, that's fine. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes, that's yes. okay. Okay, all right. Thank, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for your <laughs> graciousness. So I'll start with you, uh, Felix. What is your reaction to, uh, you know, the delivery yeah. yesterday by the Vice President? He spoke about a number of things, and as the Ghanaian Times newspaper capture, captures it, four blows forced Ghana to the eye. MF. And I've mentioned uh, those four blows from the banking sector, clean up COVID-19, the Russo-Ukrainian war and others. What is your reaction to what the vice president shared? Well, to begin with, uh, it was an unnecessary intervention. Unnecessary uh, intervention. Why? Really unnecessary. You see, it does not enrich the discourse around our problem any more than the situation was before it was delivered. People have been calling on the vice president to, to come and speak and react to the IMF yeah, situation because of things he had just, said in the past. You don't just come and speak because you have been asked to come and speak. When you speak, it must exude substance. It must add significantly to the debate. Mm. It must elevate the discourse and be able to provide further details that do not already exist. The vice president did not say anything new. Mm. did not introduce any new enlightenment to the discourse around our economic woes. He, he was not able to provide any justification that made any more sense than what already has been said. Mm. Indeed, this was a, a repetition of what he went to do uh, in Kaswa a couple of months ago. Except that it was changed with very, very ridiculous and bizarre claims. That cannot stand. But, the but, except time. which one? This particular delivery was changed Indeed, with... The, the point is that at the time when... No, no, I want to get that point. You say it was changed with ridiculous what? Very ridiculous claim, you know. That, instance, that is this, 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 this latest delivery. This claim that um, uh, he will pick the Ghana card over 1,000 interchange. Right, you right. Know, it, I it remember that. It's a mockery of the whole concept of technology uptake in the rendering of public services. Of course, there's a place for injecting technology and IT services into public service delivery. Okay. But to create an impression that that is a be all and end all of our national life, and that after that, nothing else matters, and that you don't need good. It, it's most ridiculous. I, I don't think that's what he was suggesting. I, I think he was looking at, yeah, for, for him, for a scale analysis. of preference. And, and maybe no. I, I, I knew that pro probably the NDC and maybe the former president might take that as a jab because of the interchange, you know, and infrastructure no, but debates. Mean, but, the reason why I say it's ridiculous mm. is that there's no basis for comparison of the two. 
a lot of things come together to ensure our development as a country. So there's a role for technology and right. it's uptick in the rendering of public services. But you tell me that apart from that, nothing else matters. And that you will pick interchange, uh, what the Ghana card over interchange. It's a most ridiculous idea. Why? The vice president, when he finished his program and he sat in his fleet of Mercedes Benz, did he drive on Ghana card to his destination or his home? Did he not drive on road? So if not in, if investments are not made in road infrastructure, how was he going to be able to move from wherever he came from to the place he held the event and go back? Okay. Or how do Ghanaians who are woken up this morning move from their various homes to the places of work that they go to in order to contribute to economic development? So that kind of comparison makes mockery, you know, of the very serious national discourse that we should be having. At a time when he has supervised horrendous expansions of the Ghanaian economy um, that has taken us to the house. And then, in addition to that, he proceeded to make what I described as a pitiful torrent of excuses for why we are in the mess that we are in. None of the four explanations that he offered cut eyes with people who know. I, I, are you telling me that COVID-19 did not happen and, and, and we did not struggle? I, are, you, are you telling me we did not have to go through hurdles? Are you telling me the Russo-Ukrainian war has not affected us? I, I, so, are you telling me that the banking sector cleanup has not hobbled us? I mean, what are you trying to say? So I'm going to explain to you. I'm saying that none of the four reasons we give can explain the sort of mess we are in. Because Ghana is not the only country in the world. When you come to West Africa, and I like to use West Africa because that is where we, we can compare ourselves to our neighbor. Look at our inflation rate now. It is 30%. Almost all our neighbors have single-digit inflation. All of them live in a world where there is a Russian-Ukrainian conflict. So how come that Ghana has such astronomical inflation rate and the rest of our neighbors have single-digit inflation? Look at our debt position. Our debt-to-GDP ratio after the IMF assessment, has ballooned over 90%. But none of our neighbors in West Africa has that kind of debt to GDP ratio. Look at the depreciation in our currency. Which of our neighbors has that level of depreciation? So what has simply happened is that this is a government that has mismanaged the economy by seeking to make excuses for its non-performance. So yes, COVID was a factor that affected everybody, every country in this world. But the extent to which we have suffered is symptomatic of a poorly managed economy. And rather than seeking to make that excuse, Baumia should admit that his government has made mistakes. His government has taken wrong policy choices that have landed it here. Now look at the financial sector cleanup that he speaks about. And I have had the opportunity to be in your studio to dispel that notion that he seeks to advance as a basis for the mess that we are in. You see, nobody puts a gun to Baumia's head to approve the use of 25 billion Ghana to resolve a problem that could have been resolved for less than 10 billion Ghana. When the banking sector goes into a crisis, your first option is not to collapse the affected bank. Your, the, the option that they should have gone for, which had been prepared prior to the coming into power of this government, was to bail out those banks and do certain things that strengthen them so that over time they recover and are able to contribute meaningfully to the development of our financial sector. Let me give you an example. You know, a number of those banks were actually owed money by BDCs, SOEs, and government itself. Contractors had gone to them to borrow money to execute government contracts. Government had not paid the contractors, and so the contractors were not able to service their debt in order to meet the obligations to those banks. So when you find that the banks are in this place, what you do is to honor your obligation. You pay them the money you owe them so that they can have some liquidity and be able to run their operation. Others too simply needed additional injection of capital. And all these things had been planned and discussed and were ready for implementation by the first quarter of 2017. <laughs> this government comes in and chooses the nuclear option to collapse those banks without regard to the application. Then when they finish, they realized that 4.6 million customers had been affected and that it was going to have implications for them in the 2020 election. So they just ran health after health down. Went to borrow what they claimed to be 25 billion Ghana to come and pay those people for electoral support. And you recall that after those payments, people like Baumia stood on platform and said that because they had made these payments to the customers, the people who have been affected in that manner 
she will vote for them to win election. So they sought political plot from this. And after you've done that, and it has plunged us into a mess, you come and say that because of that reason, you should be excused for this sort of money. Now let us come to the capacity, excess capacity payment. Let me put it on record on your station, that the claim that this government is pay, making excess capacity payment is a blatant falsehood. It is not true. Look, every single dollar or city that they have paid to the companies involved is money they are paying for power that has actually been produced and used by you and I. Mm. They, they, they create the impression that we didn't need the power and the companies produced it and we have to buy it. It is not true. The companies produce power which is bought and distributed to you and I. So government has really paid them for distributing or supplying power to ECG for use by consumers. Indeed, if you look, we have challenged them to give a breakdown of these payments. When you go into the breakdown, you find that they even pay companies for supplying oil. Now, I want you to ask Baumia if you have the opportunity, whether or not when oil to the tune of about 300 million Ghana cities was supplied to the IT, did they drink the oil or did they use it to bath or did they use it to wash their food? They mm. put it in their equipment and generated electricity, which they sold to us. So if you pay for money, that you need to pay because power has been supplied. How do you turn around and say that because of that, the economy is the best? When we were in power and we were paying IPC for power that they supplied us, if you complain, in any event, did they not inherit ESLA, a fund that we have created as far back as we which, as I speak to you, has yielded up to 23 billion Ghana cities. 23 billion Ghana cities. That is what they have realized from ESLA. That alone was sufficient to take care of the debt in the energy sector, so that this meant not to be good. Mm. But because of propaganda and lies, and their disrespect for the people of Ghana, a whole vice president can stand in front of us, pedal such our trade your forces, and think that he will get away. He can absorb himself from the mere criminal mismanagement of the economy that has led us into You, you call it a criminal mis mismanagement of the economy. But, but Let's look, how does it expect mm. engage in this sort of mismanagement? That imposes this sort of hardships on the people of Ghana. In any self-respecting jurisdiction, Pastor Bahamia would have resigned. He would have been long gone as the head in, of the In Constitution. fact, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, Kwame Pianim also, you know, joining the fray and saying that, I mean, he had an interview uh, yesterday with uh, Bernice Abu Beidou Lanza, my, my colleague on the show, and he said to her that, look, uh, for him, Bahamia should have resigned a long time ago. But, but... But uh, that is Ken Oforiata, the finance minister, rather, should yeah. have resigned a long time yeah, ago. But, 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 but the point, the point to be made, you know, looking at the economic management team and all of that, uh, the vice president makes mention of the fact that, look, Ghana has gone to the IMF 17 times. We all know that. And the underlying system and structure of the economy has remained the same. But after each of these 17 IMF programs, Ghana had no national ID card, no motor insurance database and all others. He talks about the new architecture for domestic revenue mobilization, for example, which should be fully operational by the end of year. Now, we've seen the gains the GRA has made year on year, even, you know, shooting its targets and all of that. He focused a lot. I listened to the, the entirety of what he said. He focused a lot on digitalization. That digitalization he speaks of, you may disagree with him when he says that, look, he would pick the Ghana card over a thousand interchanges. But that is that digitalization not making gains for us and, and, you know, shoring up our economy in ways that even if your administration came to power, you would benefit from? You see, that is a comical aspect of Bamiya's presentation. The so, comical aspect of his presentation? When, when we went to the IMF previously, there was no Ghana card. So what? Has the emergence of the Ghana card prevented us from going to the IMF? All the claims he makes about digitalization. And in any event, he is not the originator of the agenda to digitalize our economy. But that's another discussion we have at another time. But after all the so-called digitalization, digitalization efforts, so, have so, we so, so, so just, just, just to take you back, so who is the originator of the idea? Oh, this thing started way back under President Rowling. Indeed, I, I, I created the endorsement. Okay. I just, I just wanted to know how far back you would go, yeah, because I know that presidents in the Fourth Republic have... But it is an incremental program, so every government... Con but because of its pension for propaganda, and, and they're thinking that we are all dancers in this country, and that he can take credit for everything. He behaves as if he gave birth to the concept of even ICT. 
But the point I'm making is that after all this so-called specialization effort, have we not gone back to the IMF? Has that stopped us from going back to the IMF? Mm. So if in the previous program, you didn't have a Ghana card, and yet you went to the IMF, and now we, we, have, we have a Ghana card and you go to the IMF, how, how better is that from the previous time? In any event, did you not know that we had gone to the IMF on 16 different occasions before 2015? Mm. When he mounted the platform and condemned the previous government for going to the IMF. That's why I said that in a self respecting jurisdiction, he would resign. The very day it was announced that we we're going to the IMF and this government, he would resign because of all. And, 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 your, and, 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 your, and let me just make this correction it was Kwejum uh, Pieni, not Kwame yeah. Pieni. Uh, but, but under your, your tenure, you, had, uh, you, you, you went for an IMF program, and uh, you, you didn't think your vice president at the time. Uh, should should you know step aside, resign, or the finance minister said Tekwe uh, should do so. What? Why has this changed? Two reasons. First of all, we are not in the kind of mess that is like. And second, Mr. Tekwe and the lead minister did not mount platform to double in comical scale and accuse previous governments of incompetence because they went to the IMF. That is the difference between them and Baumi, and they showed surprise. They will reflect in the, in the kinds of things that they did in order to move the economy forward. They did not spend time advertising the previous, uh, the previous administration and scoring cheap political points like Baumiati. It is on that basis that he lacks the moral authority to even hold meetings with the IMF and mount platforms to defend the decision to go to the IMF. They are going to the IMF because they have run the economy down. That is a simple fact. Okay. Indeed, only a few weeks ago, mm. leading figures in this administration were denied. That they will never go to the IMF. So in a nutshell, and as I said, my time is up. I need to go. Right. I'll, 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 sneak, I'll sneak in just one final bit, and then sure. you can go. So, sure. so let me do that. I'll put them together. Sure. sure. Uh, so the vice president blames the previous administration for the IMF bailout. In fact, among other factors, he says, quote, if you take out the fiscal impact of this quadruple whammy, Ghana will not be going to the IMF for support because our fiscal debt stock and balance of payments outlook would be sustainable. Of the four factors, two, COVID-19 and the uh, Russo-Ukrainian uh, war, uh, were external. And the other two, the banking sector cleanup and the excess capacity payments, were the result of policies of the previous government. So it's 50-50. He says 50% of the burden is on them. 50% was caused by you. I want your quick take on that. And then I want your response. Do you feel... Now that's Dralevich, uh, the, the, the head of the IMF team to the country. He's come with his team. They've assessed us. They've made a, their statement and they are gone. The finance ministry has told us, per what their discussions were, that the earliest we'll get an IMF program is the first quarter of 2023. Do you feel we can get an IMF program or is our debt too unsustainable? So put uh, the blame that has been apportioned to you and the feasibility of getting a program side by side. And, and then we can call it a wrap with you. You see, the first point is that the attempt to blame the previous administration for the catastrophic mismanagement of the Ghanaian economy it was the biggest joke of the day. That's why I said that one he doubled. It, it, it was the what? Comment. It was the biggest joke of the day. You know, mm. that's why I said that one he doubled in his comedy. If after six years of handling the Ghanaian economy, he blamed the previous administration, then it is an implicit admission that he and his colleagues in government have been a waste of time of the Ghanaian election. People who are queue for you and work for you on two successive occasions, then in your state year, going into your seventh year, you say that the mess you are in is because of something that the previous administration did. You have wasted everybody's time. You, are, you do not merit the vote and confidence of the people of, the, of, of, the people of Ghana. And you should be thrown out at the earliest opportunity. Even if you put that aside, the assessments are four. They are blatant lies. And I've explained both the financial sector bailout and the energy sector payments that he took about you. Nobody forced this government to pay 25 billion. They could have used 9 billion to address the financial sector problem. And we won't be in but, this but, but you're just saying that you were not in their shoes. You cannot say that, you know, retrospectively now. You were not in no, their shoes. Not, maybe we, maybe if you were in their shoes, no, things no, would have been... No. Maybe you could have spent more. no. We did the asset quality review. We were the ones who determined that indeed the banks were in distress. Because of that, we passed two pieces of legislation to address the problem. In addition to that, we had two different exchange policies to address it. None of them included collapsing the bank. You see, what happens is that banks take people's deposits, 
they invest those funds and then pay interest. And then in the course of their business, they should be in the position to honor demand by their clients to withdraw money. So no bank will survive a run on its finances. But if customers are aware that the bank is healthy and they have liquidity, they will not rush to take their deposit. All that needed to be done was for the banks to be put in a position where they could honor their obligations to their customers on a daily basis. You don't need 25 billion cities to do that. This government decided against all sound advice to collapse the bank. The decision to collapse the bank was the decision of Paumia and his colleagues in this government. It was not the decision of the NDC. 25 billion was paid only because the banks were collapsed. So the attempt to blame the previous government is a joke. It is a cynical, disrespectful joke that the vice president must do away with. He must take himself and his office seriously. You see, when people are suffering, they are going through hardship. They are going through pain and anguish. The last thing they need is a comical performance from the vice president. They need serious, reflective, sober deliberations of the economy. Not this kind of thing. And then, as far as the capacity payments are concerned, I have already told you that it is a lie that they are paying for excess capacity. They are only paying for power that has been produced. And I'm challenging Baumia or anybody within his outfit to produce evidence that we did not need the power. Indeed, as I speak to you, if by next year we do not add about 800 megawatts of power to our generation stock, we will go back to do so. And this is contained in documents put out by the Energy Commission. I can finish with those documents. So I ask you a question. If indeed we have excess capacity, why do we need additional capacity in just a matter of 12 months? Mm. So he's not telling us the truth. He is taking the people of Ghana for a ride, peddling outrageous falsehoods, some of which verge on comical performance. Then he must cut that out and take a serious. Oh, all the right. That, point, the, the last uh, point. Do you feel we shall yes. get? We, we can get an IMF program. Looking you know, at our I, debt. The last time I came to your place, I told you that even if we apply to the IMF, there was no guarantee that we would either get the program or we will get it. Indeed, there are countries that have applied for IMF programs, and for five years they've been waiting, and they've not got the program. Because of how bad their situation is. If they had gone earlier, if they had gone to the IMF last year, as they were advised to do by several experts like uh, Dr. Lord Benson and, uh, sorry, Professor Lord Benson and Jack, we will not be in this situation. But they have allowed the situation to so deteriorate that we are a basket case. And the IMF, they don't like basket cases. They don't like dealing with countries that have too much debt. So I am sure that as a prior action, they will be asked to go and do something about our debt before the IMF touches them with the long haul. So we are here for the long haul. It is not going to be a quick and, and easy process. It will be a long, painful process because of the extent of damage. The, the vice president says that. Process. He, say, he says we will feel a lot of pain before it gets better. It will be course. worse before it gets better. Of course, but he is fully aware of what we will go through. And if it is not like any disease, if your disease is bad, if the medication is just if you have a minor ailment, the medication is light. So we have a terrible chronic which will require a lot of painful medication to get us out of. And the blame for that lies squarely on the head of Paumia and nobody else. Felix, we're grateful for your time. Thank, Thank you so you much for much. running with us uh, this far, for indulging us. Felix Kwachio for Sue. Uh, uh, of course, uh, a pivotal member of the, the, of the opposition NDC. He's a former deputy uh, minister with two portfolios, uh, information and communication. He joined us there uh, to share some thoughts on uh, the delivery yesterday by Dr. Mohamed Baumia, vice president of Ghana. Let me now come to Professor Lord Mensah, and we had to do it this way on, on account of what Felix Kwachiofosu uh, made mention of at the start of the conversation that he had to conclude and move on to other uh, matters, another engagement. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for staying with us. Professor Lord Mensah is with the University of Ghana Business School. Prof? You're welcome, You're welcome sir. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so so let's, let's start from here. I, I'll, I'll, I'll start the same way I did with Felix. What is your general appreciation of the delivery yesterday at the Accra Business School by the Vice President? What are your key takeaways? Well, um, before I go into the details of the, I mean, uh, the delivery, yeah. um, looking at the timing of the delivery, apart from, you know, uh, the digitization of the uh, program that he went to, the timing that he came to address the country on these economic issues and the, how we ended up with IMF, uh, for me, is wrong. And apart from the time, I mean, the platform that he used, 
I mean, he is the economic management team, you know, head of this country. And so if the country has taken a decision to go to IMF, I mean, it should have come earlier to address us by using a national platform. So on that score, I would say that, I mean, the vice president did not take Ghanaian serious because this is, what, this is more or less like a, um, an add-on to a program that he went to and then he had to sneak in, you know, um, addressing Ghanaians. But this was a serious issue. We should be a critical and outstanding issue that the vice president would devote time to address Ghanaians why are we going to IMF? Now, let's come to the details. You see, you realize that um, he attributed, you know, our economic woes, as we speak now, to the, uh, the happenings with uh, the currently with the Ukraine war, the COVID, and then took it back all the way to, you know, what was happening in the previous administration. Now, you've taken an economy for the past six years. I ask myself, you inherited, you know, before you asked Ghanaians to vote for you, you, inherit, you knew very well that the economy has liabilities. Exactly. The economy has assets. Exactly. And so, as an economic manager, your duty is to convert those liabilities and possibly make some assets out of it. In fact, we were told and, we would move away from taxation to production. I mean, that was, that was one of the ways we were exactly. going to do that. So, Change um, liabilities if, into if assets. You, if you have taken an economic economy and you appreciate that we had liabilities, which at this time, we're expecting that those liabilities would have created assets which are yielding dividend for us. That is not the case. Now... If you look at the analogy he gave with a carpenter issue that uh, the carpenter roof and then um, if uh, it rains and the roof get ripped off and then tornado comes in. You see, we need an architect for this economy, not a carpenter. An architect thinks of the design so that the economy will be able to receive some shocks. Right. If you ask me how to you know, measure a good economic manager, his performance, I'm going to tell you that a good economic manager is the one that is able to sell the economy through shocks that he had no control over. So right. for instance, if you take um, COVID, you take Ukraine war, these are shocks that you cannot, you don't have control over as an economic manager. But then your ability to come out clean and say that, indeed, I'm a good manager, is how you manage the country through this, you know, external shocks. Now, what did we do as a country when the COVID came? Right. The COVID came in, we had our expenditure lines, I remember very well, at the time, our budget deficit was around 43 billion, right? We kept to this budget deficit. But for a situation where you have a natural disaster, or you have, you know, a force majeure like COVID. Yeah. What you do as a country is to reduce your expenditure and then you will uh, be able to absorb the shocks that this, you know, external factors comes with. But we did we the exact opposite. We, we did the exact opposite. We, we were still aggressive spending. Mm. And it built up into the election year, convincing Ghanaians that, yes, indeed, you have some free beast with us as a result of the, you know, COVID. COVID got froze this economy, you know, for only two weeks, I can say, because we got grounded in our homes for only two weeks. After the two weeks, we started moving. Economic activity started picking up. But this administration went on further to provide the freebies, you know, until December, all in a built up to elections. So if you ask me what took us to IMF, I will attribute it to three things. One, a lessening, you know, um, um, uh, uh, excess expenditure. Two, COVID itself. And then three, government appetite for borrowing over the years. So effectively, these are the three things that took us to, you so, know. So, so you speak about, uh, just walk with me through them again. Electioneering, excess expenditure, then? Yes. COVID it, itself, 
as a COVID. natural disaster. So the COVID in itself came with its own expenditure. Right. And then it says, you know, borrowing over the years. All right. It says borrowing. Let me, let me hold you briefly on the first point. Electioneering excess expenditure. Because a lot of uh, economists and others have pointed to the fact that, look, in an election year, we've seen the trajectory. And the former administration, the Muhammad administration at a point, was trying very hard to deal with it uh, in 2016 to ensure that, you know, we wouldn't end up in a similar situation. If you recall, because we had a trajectory in the Fourth Republic, every election year, the debt soars, and whether there's a change of administration or not, we start another cycle, vicious cycle, if you like it. Uh, but this bit about an electioneering excess expenditure. If you look at our, our, our deficit over the years, you would realize that in the sub-region, in 2020, for example, when we had our last election, a lot of those in our sub-region were having deficits, budgetary deficits of 6% uh, or less. In our instance, it was upwards of 15%. I think 15.6, 15.7%. Is that what you're referencing? Is that what you're alluding to? Is that what it went into? Oh, oh yes. You see, we read the budget um, in 2019. In 2019, COVID has started lifting itself up, you know, gradually building up into 2020. Now, we, had, we read this budget purposely to satisfy the electorate. So, by so doing, we raise the hopes by spending more in excess of what we can generate. And that is when we had about 43 billion, you know, budget deficit, which was around between 15 to uh, 13 to 15 percent of our GDP. By that time, we had just exited IMF right. around somewhere 2018, 2019, which, you know, our budget deficit was almost converging the 5% that, you know, IMF, the ideal 5% that IMF proposed to us. Mm. Then, immediately we exited IMF, it became like, you know, a free kind of thing, which we, have, we can go ahead to spend, because we have no control over, you know, nobody has control over our spending. So we jumped our budget deficit to 11% of our GDP. Then we moved it to around 14%, 15% during the election. So we had, you know, the election lines of spending, that intention was there. And then the COVID intention too came in. But then we hide the electioneering, you know, excess expenditure under the COVID. And that is what has brought us this far. Mm. Now, uh, you know, he talks about the many effects, compound effects, four blows that have, you know, uh, brought us here. But... He also believes that the economy is going to be resilient, it's going to be strong, but it's going to be really tough uh, to get there. Just how tough do you envisage it's going to get before it gets better? Well, I think it's going to be tough between now and the time we, we strike a deal with I, you know, IMF. Um, and I'll propose to the government that it's about time they start engaging you know, our private creditors. Because between now to the time we get deal with IMF, which possibly they may inject something into the economy, we should know that we have interest rate obligations. We have some, you know, debts that the principal are mature. The principals are maturing within the next uh, this year and then next year. So uh, if we cannot raise enough dollars to pay, then we may probably have to start engaging them and. The proposal is that possibly we shouldn't engage, you know, uh, we shouldn't allow the current, you know, finance team to engage them. We may need an independent body to engage them. So, um, yes, it is going to be tough from now till we start getting, you know, we start, we get um, a deal with IMF. So, so some people have said, some economists have said that, you know, this is where the West also should come in, the West and the East, China especially, but the West... And if you look at our debt profiles in terms of African countries, you would notice that uh, for a lot of them, we're indebted to what? China by about 12 point something percent when it comes to the debt profile. But when it comes to uh, payments and all of that to the Western countries, it's about almost three times that, 30 something percent, which is why some people, you know, debt, just as debt, for example, a, a group is calling for a lot of these countries, especially the UK, the US and China, to speak, interact with these private lenders that you speak of, the private creditors, uh, to mitigate the situation for us, if possible, write off a few things here and there, and be more gracious to Africa at a point like this. 
Should we be pushing countries like the US, the UK, and even China on that tangent, do you feel? Would it work for us? Yes, but then uh, there are packages of that form, which um, we, may, we may tap into along the line. But then before then, you may have to set you know, your home very well. I mean, ensure that um, what took you to IMF or what brought you to this current situation, you don't go there anymore. Now, if you look at the happenings in this country, you realize that it's like we sped up to IMF because you get surprised to know, you know, a country that exited IMF within the next um, four years, within the next three years, and we're going back to IMF. So it looks like you've taken up insurance and then you've uh, decided to drive your car into a ditch and then you call for the insurance to come and rescue the situation. So for me, we may have to do our homework very well. And from now that we start pushing for those external support and then external engagement, what are we doing as a country? Now, the uh, finance minister announced uh, kind of um, a homegrown policy, like cutting 30% um, of Article 71 workers are paid and all those. How effective is that? And how much are we saving from this? If we have any revenue enhanced measures that we are putting in place, like e levy what is making the e levy not yielding as expected so before you call in for those support you may have to set up your country at a certain trajectory for them to accept that when they come in to support you it will not be into uh in vain so that at least you know by the time we end you know the uh the, the, the engagement the country may also benefit from it and so there are mm. other factors, there are other support of that form that a country can tap in. And we may have to do our homework well. Right. As things remain, from what you see and what you envisage going forward, even if we got an IMF bailout, do you feel it would just be another vicious cycle? We'll just play the insurance game that you're talking of and we could end up in the next few years with another IMF program, program number 19. Because there are economists who have said, both home and abroad, that look, our system, in fact, the vice president also admits that there are fundamental issues uh, to be dealt with. The way our system is tweaked, the way our economy is run, do you feel that there's a possibility, even if we I got think, an I IMF program? There, there, was, there, was, there was a break in, your, in the communication. Okay, so, so, so the briefly, my, my point is, even if we get this IMF program, on the back of what local and foreign economists have been saying about the structures of our economy, is it likely that even after that, a few years after, we'll be back uh, to square one at the IMF knocking on its doors again? Uh, yes, I mean, I think we may have to look at the structure of the economy very well. I mean, it is an economy that um, we may have to um, think about, you know, export diversification, Right. We may have to think about, you know, um, possibly working towards um, certain levels of uh, in, um, producing some foods that we don't necessarily have to import, reduce our import portfolio. So if you have a policy like planting for food and jobs, you take certain, you know, staples that Ghanaian consume. So if it's maize or rice, I mean, just make sure that, I mean, you grow them in abundance. So that you can have storage because every household consumes, you know, maize or rice. But then we 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 also have to look at you know some of the expenditure lines. The way we spend on constructing our roads, we do road. You have, is it not money that has gone into it? What is the I mean the, the the duration or the maturity of the debt that we use in financing the road? If you borrowed for seven years and you use it to do a road for three years and the road get wiped off, I mean, what exactly uh, is, 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 is happening to the country? At the end of the day, we may adapt, you know, certain uh, model where we can remove some expenditure lines from the government purse and then relay it to the private man. If you ask me, road construction to a certain standard should be left for the, the private man. If you take, for instance, you take a crowd, you want to, you know, um, bring fence roads around the, the, the city to ensure that you ease traffic. This can be given to the private man. But it is difficult because the, uh, 
a minute, please. Sure. So we're still here with uh, Professor Lord Mensa, uh, who is sharing his thoughts. So we'll be wrapping up shortly with his uh, final thoughts, but he's been sharing quite a number of thoughts I mean, on the economy I mean, and uh, you know what his feeling is in terms of passing the buck on to the previous administration. Now, he was just sharing with me when I posed the question to him about whether, even if we got a program now, we could end up back at the door of the IMF. And he said categorically, yes. Please go ahead, Prof. Yes, until we change the, the structure of the economy, we may end up with, you know, um, IMF again. Mm. Because, I mean, what sends us to IMF is how we import more than we export. Fine, there are countries that their import and their exports usually, you know, get balanced. But then what are they importing? Are they products that they can easily grow in their environment? If they are products that they can easily grow in their environment, then I think they are doing a country harm. So it's about time we look at our import portfolios, and especially for the food. We ensure, because we are in the topics, the weather is very favorable. If we're going to spend on agriculture, I don't think we're going to spend that much on agriculture. We're beginning to lose you a bit, uh, Prof. Maybe we can wrap the conversation. Uh, I don't know whether you can hear me, but if you can, I would have us wrap the conversation on two quick points. One, do you feel we will get an IMF program, that we have the capacity, uh, based on what you've seen, to get an IMF program? And secondly, uh, what is your take on the 15% COLA that has now been granted to labor unions? How will that impact our economy? Two questions quickly to wrap the conversation. Uh, Prof, are you with me? It would not prioritize. No, man. Hello, Prof. Hello. All right. So we'll try to get uh, Professor Lord Mensa uh, maybe on the phones uh, because for now, uh, uh, connecting with him via video, uh, you know, is, is becoming a bit problematic. You know about the network connectivity. Uh, in our country. So we'll try to do that and wrap the conversation quickly. But uh, the quick point that I would like to run by him, two of them, whether he feels genuinely that we can get an IMF program, looking at our current situation, the status quo, and what we are promising to do to bring our debt levels to sustainable levels. And there's no too high when it comes to debt or too low, if you know about the economics of it, but it's about your unique situation and where that positions you uh, in terms of your debt stock. The other bit is, now that we know 15% uh, has been granted uh, to the labor unions by way of COLA, what is going to be the impact of that on our economy? What does he foresee? I'll be posing those questions to him when he returns. But like we've been uh, discussing, I, we started the conversation with Felix Kwachiofosu, uh, who is a former deputy communications minister, also former deputy information minister. And he was saying that the delivery yesterday by the vice president was nothing short of a joke and that they should grow past blaming uh, the erstwhile administration for uh, the happenings currently and that uh, we should also be honest with ordinary uh, Ghanaians in terms of the outlook, the reality of our economy as it stands now, and what we can do as, as a people. If we have to bite the bullet, uh, we have to do that exactly. Let me also quote for you a few of uh, things that uh, former president, in fact, now uh, uh, I'm talking about the current vice president, Baumia, delivered yesterday. He says, quote, Ghana has gone to the IMF for a program 17 times since independence, and after each IMF program, uh, the underlying system and structure of the economy remained the same. And each of the 17 IMF programs, Ghana had no national ID card, no motor insurance database, etc. He's been uh, harping a lot on the bit about uh, domestic, uh, you know, digitalization uh, processes. Also roping in the new architecture for domestic revenue mobilization, which he says should be ready by end of year. And this is where it gets interesting, where he plays the blame game. He has 
said that if you take out the fiscal impact of this quadruple whammy, and what is he talking about? He's talking about uh, Ghana, uh, you know, he's talking about the four factors, the Russia-Ukrainian war, he's talking about COVID-19, he's talking about the banking sector cleanup, he's talking about uh, excess capacity uh, payments, and that these hobbled the economy. But he apportions two of them, of course, COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukrainian war, to their term, uh, you know, our government's term, and then he apportions the other two when it comes to the banking sector cleanup and the excess capacity we have to the previous administration and says, if not for those, we wouldn't be going to the IMF. Enough to think about for later when we activate uh, the phone lines. But we'll still try uh, to, to get Professor Lord Mensah. It appears uh, we're not getting him. I would have really wanted to get a stake on... On, 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 on the cola and uh, how he feels that would impact our economy. Um, let's, maybe we'll try it one last time uh, to see whether we can get him. I see a lot of your comments coming to, through. At the appropriate time, we shall uh, take them. A lot of you are responding to uh, the comments of the vice president yesterday, and some of you have very interesting responses on our Facebook live uh, stream. So, we have Professor Lord Mensah back with us. Prof, can you hear me? Yes, 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 I All can right. hear you. So, two quick matters, very quickly, uh, to wrap the conversation. The first one was, do you genuinely feel, looking at the status of our economy currently, uh, we're going to get an IMF program come the first quarter of 2023? And secondly, the 15% COLA uh, that has been negotiated with Labour, how do you foresee that impacting our economy? Yes, um, if you look at uh, the structure of the economy and the budget that we bred, you know, for 2022, if in the review, the budget review, the finance minister does not show any sign of, you know, repentance or possibly give the signal. If he doesn't show any sign of repentance. Yes. <laughs> or possibly give the signal of being soft when it comes to expenditure we may not get that program. So in other words, we must, as, as we approach the mid-year budget review, which was not delivered because of the IMF program, we must reduce spending. Exactly. Okay. That's how we're supposed to be. And make sure that, you know, we give a direction that possibly our budget deficit, we reduce it completely. Because if you look at a 2022 budget, I mean, most of the indicators in the expenditures and revenue generation line, they were not, you know, on target. Okay. And so effectively, we have to show that signal of, you know, being conserved in our, you know, projections in the budget review. Then that will tone down and give some possible confidence to the investment community. And at the same time, you know, the IMF that we're trying to engage. So, so can we, can we get it or not? Out. We'll get it only based on these factors, right? Yes, of course. I mean, but you need to do your homework very well before they come in. But the IMF knows very well that what they give you will not be enough to restructure the economy. But they understand that they will give you that kind of hard benefit, which is the money they give you, and then the soft benefit, which is the discipline that they instill in the economy as far as our expenditure is concerned. Okay. So effectively, um, we have to start giving the signal that we are ready to engage them All right. by softening you know, our expenditure lines. And then on, possibly, on the second matter of COLA, very quickly, sir, uh, sir w w w how, how do you feel that is going to impact our economy? 15%? So the COLA, I don't think it will impact you know, our economy. You see, when you read a budget, there are projections. And projections does not necessarily mean that you're supposed to meet all the um, targets. Now, if you take um, the budget that we read, clearly, we have expenditure lines for CAPEX, which the government gave the indication that they may go all out for Agenda 111. And then, you know, we have other CAPEX in there. And I always split our expenditure lines into two. We have the discretionary and the non-discretionary. The discretionary, you don't have, you have control over what you spend. So if you want to do, uh, you want to have, uh, what do you call it, 111 uh, district hospitals, you may reduce it to 50. And then possibly, but for interest rate and then compensation, you can't, you know, touch them. And so those are non-discretionary. So 
It's about reallocating and really, you know, aligning the budget to ensure that you fill in what the, the labor need. And what labor is asking for is rational. Because if you look at inflation, I will tell you that household inflation, as we speak now, is more than 50%. But what mm. is on paper is weighted, and that is why we see uh, 29.8. So effectively, if they are asking for uh, 20 and they've gotten 15, well, I would say that it's better than nothing. But then in the end, it doesn't you know, end up making the style of living you know, very uh, improved. Or rather, we may have to focus on how we can restructure the economy to ensure that food becomes cheap. You know, mm. so that people can put food on their table every now and then, easily. Prof, it's been great, as always. We're really grateful that you took the time to join us, first via Zoom and now via phone. We're very grateful. Professor Lord Mensah uh, is a lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. Earlier, we had Felix Kwachiofosu, former Deputy Communications Minister, former in, uh, Deputy Information Minister under the erstwhile uh, administration, also sharing his blunt, uh, you know, uh, thinking on... Uh, the delivery yesterday by the vice president. Stay with us because coming up next, we're going to up the ante. The, the labor unions have arrived at some sort of agreement on COLA with uh, government, the employer, 15%, as we've mentioned. What are the dynamics in there that we should note? And uh, what is going to be the reality? What are the expectations? Also coming up, we're going to be talking about the Sarah Adwasafo conundrum. The, the Domekwa Benya MP is still at large, uh, so to speak. Jose Wusu, first deputy speaker, has had his take on the matter. But how is it going to shape up in parliament? Those are the crucial issues we're going to be discussing on next. Bernice Abubeidu at Lanza will be serving you that. Do stay.